Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to our next edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. Sydney's inner west property market offers a kaleidoscope of diverse suburbs, each with its own unique character and price points. The beauty of the inner west is its close proximity to the city, its eclectic housing styles, from 150-year-old Balmain terraces, sweeping waterfront homes in Dremoyne or Birchgrove, and trendy apartments and townhouses in Newtown and Marrickville. The style of properties is equally matched by the diversity of people from all cultural backgrounds calling the inner west home. The abundance of fabulous eating places means you can eat your way around the world by visiting just a few suburbs. It's a part of Sydney that is highly sought after by property investors seeking to capitalise on consistently strong growth and solid rent returns. In this episode, we'll dissect the Inner West's unique landscape, analysing trends shaping its future. We'll address many questions including what's the outlook for 24? Are vendors still hesitant? What's going on with buyer sentiment? Which suburbs are hidden gems? So buckle up for some insights on pricing, demographics, negotiating strategies, and more. So to answer these many more questions, today I have Thomas McGlynn, CEO of Bresic Whitney with me. Thomas, great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Rich. So we have a tradition, and I'm gonna throw you a thought of the week, and just like to get your perspectives on this, Thomas, and it is from Jim Rowan, who says, either you run the day or the day runs you. What do you take from that? That's a great quote. I think, you know, a lot of us go through life sometimes just in, uh, you know, automatic mode. I, I, I take from that, and one thing we talk with our team a lot about is, you know, are you approaching your week in the way that you want to approach it, or are you just letting things come towards you and just dealing with them? So are you playing offense or are you playing defense with yeah. regards to your time? I guess yeah. I'm big on sporting that's analogies. <laughs> um, Especially with the Super Bowl this week. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's sort of how I take that. I think that everyone, mm. you know, there's, there's a lot of things in life that you, you cannot control, but there is a lot that you can. Mm. And, um, you know, I think from that, it's about approaching your day and your week and your life in general with, you know, the things that you can control and, and uh, moving them in the right direction. So I love that quote. From That's Jim great. Yeah. Well, I think time's a finite resource, right? And mm. I've always been taught the concept of an ideal week. You know, you've got the big rocks in your week. So it might be exercise or meeting with vendors or meeting with buyers. And then you put in the little rocks and then the sand and then the water and you've got to fill it up. But the problem is we always have the tyranny of the urgent. Like we're always going after the, the new shiny thing or the thing that grabs your attention. You've got to build what I call deep work into your life. That's something I've learned the last couple of years being a business owner and CEO. You've got to do that deep work and set aside time for yeah, it. So, you're exactly right. Yeah. So look, let's get into it. Tell me, how did you get into the real estate game and, and what was your first gig in real estate? Well, I guess like a lot of people, you kind of get into the industry by chance. I mean, it wasn't that by chance. I'm, I'm third generation real estate agent and um, certain parts of my family have been selling real estate for a very, very long time. Um, so my family own a real estate business on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland right. and um, a really successful Century 21 business. And I just started uni and I thought I'd better get some business experience. So I approached Kerry and, yeah. um, and said, can I come and do some work with yourself and, and her, her partner, Damien? And uh, within the week, I found myself doing sort of odd jobs for, for Damien and um, letterbox drops and all that different sort of stuff. So yeah. that, was, that was my first awesome. job. I was 18 at the time, yeah. Fantastic. And I guess, um, you know, you've, you've really stepped up in your game to become CEO. Like how, how many agents are there now in the whole Bressick Whitney team across the board? We've got uh, 
approximately 140 to 150, um, depending on contractors and so forth, people operating within the business. And I'd yeah. say about 65 to 70 of them are in the sales team. Fantastic. And tell me the geographic boundaries of the business. Where do you cover? Where do you sort of draw the boundary lines? Well, traditionally, so we're a 20 year old business and traditionally we'd sold within say five kilometer radius of the CBD. Um, areas such as the inner east, you know, the real inner west. Yeah. Um, and in the past five or six years, we've really tried to broaden our horizons with that. And so, you know, a big thing for us is we really want to concentrate on selling real estate within a sort of 10 to 15 kilometer radius of the CBD now, which encompasses the entire inner west, entire eastern suburbs, the inner city marketplace, and then areas, you know, across the Lower North Shore, back into you know, Hunters Hill, Gladesville. So um, that's been something that's been a priority of ours over the course of the past mm. three to five years. But um, we're only focused on Sydney real estate. I've noticed. Um, I mean, I've been doing this game twenty three years, but I've noticed a real push into the uh, Lower North Shore uh, of late, which is great. You seem to be getting some attraction in Hunters Hill, Gladesville, right into those sort of got it to the, the traditional yeah. areas there. So that's, that's a pretty good strategy, right? Yeah, it's pleasing. Because the one thing that you can see from the research is that it's more pronounced today than it ever has been before. I think COVID played a big part in this, mm. is the traversing across the harbour front suburbs. Mm. You know, I think that there is a lot of crossover of people travelling from the east to the inner west, between the Long Shore back to the inner west. Um, you know, people pushing further west out into places like Dremoyne, Russell Lee, then into, say, Hunters Hill as their family grows. So mm. um, strategically, I think it's something that, you know, helps us grow, but it also helps with regards to getting the best outcomes for all of our clients, mm. which is, yeah, it's pleasing. It's great. So in your role, I mean, you're still actively auctioning, selling. I see your Instagram posts every week and getting some great results, but you, you're obviously in touch with the market, and I'd love to sort of tap into your perspectives on what you're seeing in terms of the mood of the market. But let's just go back to last year, 2023. How would you describe the state of the market last year? And then we'll look at this year in a minute. Well, if I was to sum it up, I'd say surprising because I don't think at the back end of 2022, and you'd, you'd know this, Rich, from um, you know all the work that you do, is that it was actually a very tough market coming into the back end of 2022. And there'd been some quite large declines with regards to um, property prices from the peak um, throughout COVID. And many people were predicting that to continue at the start of 2023. But the market really started very, very strongly. It was largely driven by you know, the stamp duty reform that the Liberal government at the time um, had implemented um, that's since not, not, not in place anymore. But that did push a lot of first home buyers into yeah. the market. And so, you know, I think that Last year, by and large, many of the declines that people had experienced in property prices throughout 2022 were, were actually regained. Mm. Mm. And there wasn't a huge amount of economists that were, were predicting that, especially in the face of a you know, rapidly rising interest rate environment. That was the interesting thing, right? Mm. You know, I'm an economist by background as well, but yeah. there were fewer, few that actually picked it, but most of them were traditionalising their, their perspectives. But, you know, again, it comes down to supply and demand. The shortage of supply and the massive migration in 2023, we just saw some significant increases in face of, despite you know, the, the interest rate rises, right? So, yeah, so, mm -hmm. I think, so I think 2023 was, was a, a, a very good marketplace for sellers, and that was very surprising. Mm -hmm. And for buyers that had bought in, uh, in 2022, especially the back end of 22, they they did really well mm. with their with their um, capital gains. I would say throughout 2023. Mm. So, mm. Um, you know, I think it was a you know a very very good robust market. Okay, so let's think about the year ahead. We're recording this in February 24. What what's the outlook that you're seeing for both buyers and sellers in 2024? And, and are you seeing vendors still anxious or nervous about listing at the moment? Well, there's definitely been an, up, an uptick in listings come to market. I know for us, um, we started off the year in January, 30% up year on year for listing volume. Mm -hmm. um, and that's since risen to almost 45% um, for at least mm -hmm. the first eight weeks of, of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people would say, okay, well, that means that 
we probably will see a flattening marketplace, maybe even a slight decline here and there, depending on the suburbs. Mm. But buyer inspection numbers are up 25%. So it does seem there's still a lot of people out there looking to buy. It's very difficult, I think, to predict mm. early on because as you know, Rich, there's some people that like to get out there early in the year just to see what's going on. Yeah. Um, and they're not necessarily gen genuine buyers looking to, to buy right now. Uh, my prediction for this year is that there's going to be some twists and turns and a lot of the um, sentiment within the market does depend on, you know, larger macroeconomic events mm -hmm. and the people that are tied to those events and the comments that they make. For example, the Reserve Bank Governor. And this has been a big shift. Yeah. People, people in my experience, say five to ten years ago, would wait for um, information to come to, to, to hand um, observe things for themselves and then make decisions based upon that information. Now people are largely acting on speculation, mm. not even the facts. So we saw that obviously with, mm. um, you know, the Reserve Bank governor many years ago saying we were going to have four years of historically low interest yeah. rates. Yeah. And people did mm. make decisions based Leveraged on Leveraged up, yeah, yeah, no interest rates till 2024. Yeah. Yeah. And you can start to see that the language of the new Reserve Bank governor is yes, inflation has come down, the retail figures were quite good, yeah. however, we cannot count out exactly. interest rate rises. I, I use the word rhetoric, you know, or yeah. jawboning. The Reserve Bank has got better at using their language that they use, and everyone's dissecting their statements to the nth degree. You know, and that's why they left that line in there. You know, we won't hesitate to rise interest rate, raise interest rates if we think it's there. But, yeah. but like you say, a lot of people do act on that speculation, mm -hmm. which, is, which is unfortunate rather than, rather than facts. You know? Yeah. So I think this year is going to be one of those years where there might be some great selling opportunities, but there also might be some great buying opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we haven't really experienced um, you know, all that much. Because in 2022, it, it, I believe it was firmly in the buyer's favour. 2023, um, it ended up being firmly in the seller's favour. And I think we're most likely going to see a marketplace where you might go see 10 auctions and half of them you say, wow, that was a very strong price for the owner. And another half you might say, I think that's actually a very fair price for the buyer. Mm. Um, and that's an interesting dynamic for us mm. to, to be in. Mm. So you're kind of suggesting it could become a more balanced market. And I think you're right, because I think there's definitely going to be more listings. I mean, I'm always tracking uh, distressed listings or mo what they call motivated listings. You know, Louis Christopher from SQM is, is obviously noticing a rise, but I'm not seeing blood on the street either. I'm not seeing lots and lots of foreclosures or anything like that, because people have had significant sums of money over the COVID period to actually pay down their loans. Now, all of those savings are not completely exhausted, but they're getting to a point where it's getting a lot tighter. And I'm hearing a lot of conversations in families and households saying, gee, our budget's tight, can we hold on to this property? So I think you'll see probably more motivated sellers, not necessarily distressed sellers. So that provides an opportunity for the buyers. But I think we always put a, an element of realism on those comments to say, don't expect to get a bargain because there's gonna be plenty of other buyers also competing for that same limited stock that's out there. Oh, I agree with you, Rich. I, I think that the Sydney marketplace is so robust as a market, you only need to look at the last couple of periods of, of downturns and anyone who didn't buy because they thought the market might run a little bit further down mm. would probably have a lot of regret yeah. over their indecisiveness of not buying. Exactly. And you only need to study throughout the global financial crisis, many parts of Australia reduced by 50%. Yeah. Whereas by and large, Sydney only really reduced by seven to 10%. So if you're chasing a big discount, like you're saying, that's not a, that's not a great it's strategy not a, not a good in strategy. the Sydney marketplace. No, no, that's so. right, yeah, no, I agree. So I think a lot of people also to that point during COVID that really didn't pull the trigger are regretting it. I think there's gonna be a wave of those buyers come into the market this year. I think there will be FOMO toward the end of the year. I mean, I think the first rate cut will probably come in July or August if inflation continues to trend down at the rate that it is. But once that first rate cut comes in or once all the figures are showing that a rate cut's coming, you watch the market reignite. And we've still got massive migration. We've still got massive undersupply. Those two factors combined alone is going to drive and underpin the property market. I mean, some economists are saying the city market will do about 5% conservatively. I think it's going to be 7 to 10, personally. 
Um, but at the first six months of this year is what I call the window of opportunity. While cost of living pressures, finance is tight, I think for the buyer pool, that's the time to be jumping in. Not that you, there's a perfect time, but if you're trying to pick a window, the next you know five, six months is pretty good in my yeah. view. No, I think they're good insights. Yeah. I'd like to ask you a bit about the inner west. I mean, that's your, your sort of stamping ground, bread and butter. Tell me what you're seeing in terms of trends in the inner west market at the moment. Yeah, the inner west market's really, really interesting because you know, I, I, I look back to say when the lockout laws in Sydney were implemented and the inner east used to be the mecca for restaurants, cafes, um, and you know, things that people like to enjoy with their, you know, with their Sydney lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying the inner west is, you know, you mentioned earlier in, the, um, in your you know, introduction with regards to your ability to be able to, to taste the world with different types of you know, restaurants and cuisines and so forth. But um, you know, the lockout law, laws really meant that people, entrepreneurial people that, that have hospitality businesses looked for different avenues and different places to invest and to open. The younger generation of, of, of entrepreneurs in the hospitality arena also um, were more moving to areas where there was value for rents and commercial and so forth. And that led to Marrickville being included in one of the most livable cities, uh, suburbs, sorry, in the world in time out. It came from nowhere. Mm. And that's happened across the board. It's not just happened in Marrickville. Now, if you look at the brewery scene mm. in many, many areas of um, many areas of Sydney, well, it's all centred around those those areas at Marrickville and and around. So, if you're thinking about someone wanting to go have a good time on a Saturday or Sunday, you know, a lot of the time they're going to these areas. So, that therefore has meant there's been a lot more editorial from you know big publications, new p- newspapers, you know, online journalism um, on a lot of inner west suburbs and that has meant that it's been a lot more visible to people that potentially may not have journeyed out to the inner west from areas like um, the eastern suburbs um, and um, from areas you know like the Lower North Shore mm-hmm. and I think there's been uh, uh, you know a lot of new families look to buy in the inner west because of the value you get mm. for the houses you can buy the lifestyle you can get from the local cafes and restaurants. And I think schooling has also been something that you know, a lot of people are identifying a lot of inner west schools, both public and private, as being a, a great place to be able to mm. send their children mm. um, for school. The other thing to think about with that too has been the rise of the trophy home in the inner west. Mm. And what I mean by that is that you have some beautiful, beautiful Victorian homes, new builds as well. And a lot of people over the past five years have invested um, architecturally into their homes. And a lot of these homes are now starting to come to light. And they're breaking new grounds with the prices that are being achieved. And you know, I do think the Inner West now does have a trophy home category because you only need to look at some of the homes that have sold in Annandale, Balmain, mm-hmm. Birchgrove, even into areas like Dulwich Hill, yeah. Summerhill, mm-hmm. Marrickville. Big prices. Mm. So I think that that, that that shows that the inner west has really gone through a bit of a trans, transformative um, period. Just and on the trophy home, are people knocking down and rebuilding or are they renovating grand Victorian terraces? What, what are you seeing in that both. department? Yeah. Both. Mm. I, I really do think it depends on, on, on the real estate because in certain pockets you've got obviously homes that have, you know, Heritage features, that's difficult to, yes. to, to obviously do you can't knock down. a lot to, you can't knock them down. But there's also brick homes in some yeah. of these areas you can knock down. Yes. So, but if you look at Annandale in particular, the mm. homes that you have there mm. are, are very, very similar to some of the homes that you might find across, say, Mossman or certain parts of the eastern suburbs. Well, they're bigger blocks in Annandale, aren't they? That's the thing. I mean, Johnson Street's fantastic. It's wide, right? And it's got some stunning homes. And but a lot of parts of you know, the other inner west have 300 metre square blocks, and that's, you know. <laughs> exactly. And what we've noticed is that you've, you've got a lot of professional people, mm. um, lawyers, mm. doctors, you know, business owners, CEOs, mm. executives, choosing to, to come to these areas because yeah. of the value they get for their investment is, mm. is, is a lot. So 
Um, that's something that I think, if you think about all of those things, it's it's a yeah. really exciting time, I think, yeah. to not only be an owner um, across the inner west, but to be a resident. I find, you know, I do a lot of travel in my business and seen a lot of changes over the years, but you're absolutely right. I've always found the inner west has got a more of a vibe, you know, a bit like the castle, it's the vibe of the thing, right? You know, but it's it's kind of a more alive, you know, the upper North Shore is kind of leafy and a little bit sedate. And I see a lot of, you know, potentially older families downsizing and moving because they want the cafe lifestyle. They like that sort of makes them feel younger, where it's a bit more things happening in the, in the local market. Um, but I'm curious to also ask you what, what property types, you kind of touched on it, but what property types do you think are going to be in most demand in the next couple of years in the inner west? Is it, is it the, you know, the really low maintenance townhouse? Is it the grand terrace that's been renovated what do you think is going to be most in demand for the different buyer types i believe the the homes that um you know only five kilometers away if you jump on the other side of the, the city you're paying double yes for yeah i think so there's a great value proposition is what yeah, you're telling me okay. yeah i think those homes yeah. now they could be homes that do need quite a bit of work that's been a big change that we've yeah. seen mm. you know Three years ago, as construction costs became, mm. you know, a lot more expensive, people mm. just did not want to touch mm. um, renovation jobs. Yep. And mm-hmm. there was, you know, a lot of uh, buyers looking to buy properties that didn't need any work done. That's changed now. So, someone who's looking to buy, they go, well, why would I not consider going into, say, the inner west? When, let's just say, for example, um, Forest Lodge, even parts of Glebe. Now, I know that's the real inner fringes of the inner west. However, why would you not consider these marketplaces? Why would you not consider Toxteth Estate, for example, when you can get double the the property for the same price compared to buying in maybe Darlinghurst or Paddington? Mm. Mm. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. The five kilometre mm. travel time, yeah. and yeah. I don't know if that's mm. that's enough to stop you from doing that, mm. and that has happened. So mm. Mm. I believe those properties are going to be the most popular. So it's mm. probably those middle range, mm. yeah. and um, we've already seen that to start this year with, with, with auctions. We're only really two weekends into proper auction um, um, territory. Yeah. And already seeing the middle range properties in the inner west are performing the strongest already. There you go. Mm. Already. So, mm. and there's just a lot of that. There's a lot of value there, a lot of growth mm. still there. To, Excellent. To happen, I think. Tell me about the buyers. Where are they coming from? Is it is it mostly buyers just moving within the inner west, or are you seeing a lot of buyers come from out of the area? And what sort of demographic are they? Yeah, so I would say that you've got your traditional buyers that they grew up in the inner west or when they've lived in the city, they've always lived in the inner west. And, you know, they will make the decision to, you know, firstly buy a two-bedroom apartment, upgrade that maybe to, you know, a smaller terrace or a smaller um, semi, and then they'll make that progression up to the family home. So you've got that, which has always been the case. But then you do have people coming from the eastern suburbs. And I know a lot of people don't believe that that is a reality, but it is a reality. If you look at the major portals like Domain and realestate.com and you look at where inquiry is coming from, it's happening. Interesting. People are coming from the east and they're looking at places. Is that driven, do you think, by affordability or they're just chasing that particular lifestyle in the inner west? I, I, firstly, I think it's affordability, but then once they spend more time, just like you said earlier, they spend more time in the inner west and they go, this is actually pretty good. Yeah. This is actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's happening a lot. We are seeing people though um, go from the inner west to then the lower north shore. And that might be when their kids get to high school age yeah. mm-hmm. and they've got um, traditions of where they wanna go for, for, um, mm-hmm. for their families mm-hmm. or if they want a bigger home um, that you might, you get a different type of home. Say for example, you might go from the inner west to somewhere like Cremorne or yep. um, to, to Mossman for example. But by and large, I would say that buyers are coming to the inner west from the eastern suburbs and from the Lower North Shore. 
we really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast, and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues, and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help, and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Excellent. Really good insights there. I want to ask you about pricing. Um, you know, where, where are prices going, do you think? I want your crystal ball there, but, give me, but maybe just give me a few examples of different price points. You know, tell me where you think pricing for apartments at the lower end of the market for the first home buyer or the investor might be getting in. Tell me where you think pricing for terraces, townhouses, and then talk about sort of the upper end, the trophy homes and the waterfronts. Can you give me a bit of a flavour on that? Yeah, yeah, and it's actually a really good question because you're almost operating in a couple of different markets within a market there. The the apartment market in general across Sydney, but, but in the inner west, it hasn't had the same growth as what houses have. And what I mean, when I say houses, I mean terraces, yeah. freestanding houses, yeah. semis. It just hasn't yeah. for a number of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, you've really only been dealing with owner occupiers and there hasn't been a huge amount of investors in the market in the last two years. You can see that with the shortage of, mm-hmm. of investment properties. Yes. And many investment properties have been coming onto the market and then being bought by owner occupiers. Mm. Is that just on that? Is that an opportunity for the investor? It's a huge giving, opportunity. Giving the rents that they could command for those those. those it's properties. a huge opportunity, especially because you can refinance, for example, once interest rates come down, and they will come down. Yeah. Whether or not it's this year or next year, they mm. will come down. Yeah. So I actually think that's a very, very good opportunity. So mm. apartments in particular, I think, are providing an enormous value at mm. the moment. Mm-hmm. Then if we then look at um, moving into you know homes... I agree with what you said earlier, Rich. I think the first half of this year is going to, um, some buyers might think they're competing for properties, but that won't be um, anything compared to what it will be like if we see one or two interest rate drops this year. Now, I'm not gonna pick it because I don't, I I, I think there's so many things that can happen, so many variables that can happen. But let's just say from what you were saying, there is an interest rate drop Mm. in July or August. Mm. So before spring, I think we'll be in for a very, very strong spring mm-hmm. for sellers. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that the growth that we'll see this year will most likely occur at the back end of the year. Yes. And I do think that we could see growth similar to what we saw mm-hmm. last year, if we're looking at the average, mm-hmm. which is exactly what you said, yeah. 7 to 10%. Yeah. So, um, and then you have to look at the next category up, which is you start moving into... Um, I don't say luxury because some people might not consider some of these homes luxurious, but they certainly are trophy homes. Mm. And I, I think that's a trend that's only going to continue to happen. Mm. And it's going to get a lot of, um, it's going to get a lot of air noise mm. across editorial media because each time one of these records is broken, it's like, wow, that resets happened. the precedent. Now in the Long North Shore and, um, and the eastern suburbs and out towards Hunters Hill, and Lane Cove and these other type of areas, these big sales are not out of the norm. So they kind of, they happen, people talk about them for a little bit, and then it's on to the next. When some of these big sales happen um, across the inner west, that's big news. And that only brings more attention to them and only makes it more normal that these prices are getting achieved. So I think that, I think you'll see actually, you know, some, some good growth um, across that end of the market. It's always hard though to tell you know, how strong it is because you might, you're not dealing with like 100 sales. Yeah. You might be dealing with 10 to 15 big sales. So it's very difficult to ascertain yeah. and put that into, you know, I well, think, the, um, clarity. Well, the turnover rate at that, in that luxury, you know, and, and upper end market is very low, you know, and that's why there's, there's such strong competition. That's why pricing is so strong. So, mm-hmm. so other question for you, I sort of want to delve into your, I guess, mode of operating and how you, how you sort of do listings. How do you actually determine what price guide or what price a property should be sold for when you're actually signing up a vendor? Yeah, and that's something that I don't think is an exact science, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. 
real estate doesn't come with a recommended retail price. <laughs> and that is very difficult. Mm. I actually think for all parties that are involved in the mm. transaction. Mm. And, you know, so for us, we really try and look at what is sold, what we know is coming up, because this is one thing as well, that if you're a localized agent that keeps your finger on the pulse, you should know also what is coming up. Yes. And that can determine whether or not your price guide is more or less in some instances. Yep. Hmm. And the reason why I say that that's important is that generally everyone's looking at the past to predict the guide for the future hmm. rather than what might be coming up. So it's a mixture. It's looking at what's hmm. sold. It's looking at seller motivation in terms of what they want out of the sale too. Hmm. And it's also looking at what properties can we see coming onto the marketplace. Hmm. Uh, and I think it's our job to provide that information and context to owners to help them understand um, where they should position their property in the marketplace. Because um, that, you know, you, you overprice a property that can be detrimental to your sale, but equally as well, you could underprice a property and you might be attracting the wrong buyer. Mm. It's a constant, uh, I guess, pain or challenge for my buyer's agents is they, they look at the guides and they go, that's rubbish, that's way underquoted. And obviously a lot of agents do it simply to attract attention and, and create that competition. Um, so I guess it's a difficult task you've got in the sense that you might not know what it's gonna go for at auction, but you have gotta be within 10%. I mean, obviously whatever someone puts on your agency agreement, you can't advertise a price higher or 10% higher or lower than that. But I see so many agents just typically still underquote, which is so frustrating for buyers out there. The one thing that I get more frustrated with is the no price strategy. Mm. Because what that basically is creating is an owner that might want a really high unrealistic figure. Yes. And no price just makes everyone assume that I'm a chance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a bigger problem for the industry mm. than... Um, the culture that is within some some pockets of the industry mm. of convincing an owner to go really low on a price. Mm. Yeah. And the reason why I say that's a big challenge is because it's an easier conversation to have with an owner. Mm. To get agreement from an owner to put a fair price on an auction property is actually not an easy conversation. Because I can imagine because they, they've got lofty, ex if I'm a vendor, they've got lofty expectations. And you're dealing with potential um, other yeah. agents yeah. who might have told an owner a very big price to yeah. try and win the listing. Win the listing. Exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I don't think there's an exact science on it. I do believe though, having worked um, in a previous life across Australia, mm. um, and looking at different ways that different people do it. I mean, in mm. Queensland, it's actually against it's against um, the legislation for you to even talk price with an owner, uh, with a buyer. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, that makes it, it makes the cat and mouse game even harder in Queensland. It's ridiculous. Oh, I find that I find that very very difficult, mm. and um, you know, so it's not an exact science. I do think that there's areas that we can you know work mm. on to get better at that to make it better for for mm. you know everyone that's involved in the in the transaction. Mm. But by and large, you know, we're looking at what's sold, what the current market conditions are, and what is, what is coming. I really like that. I haven't heard that before. That's a really good insight, I guess, for our listeners, for, for you, from your perspective, for what's coming up. It's not just historical data. It's looking at that. It's looking at the mood and, and the climate, sorry, the economic conditions, the climatic conditions, and then what's coming up. I think that's excellent. So that's great. Um, another question, well, let's get off pricing and talk about value. Um, you know the joke about economists, right? They know the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> but let's talk about value because you, you could probably pinpoint a couple of suburbs to me that you might think are what I call undervalued. Like I'm talking the hidden gems here. So for our audience, have you got any, any particular suburbs in the inner west you would go, you know what, that's got excellent potential for price growth. What would you say to that? Um, a, lot of these, a lot of these suburbs I actually think now are on the way to realizing their value. Yeah. But a lot of the a lot of the suburbs in across say the inner west if we're staying on the inner west uh, village suburbs, yep. Dulwich Hill, Summerhill, Petersham, Lewisham. I I just think there is enormous value in these areas and I truly do believe that suburbs that 
have a village mm. and have a village community. You know, I think in the world that we're going into where, you know, people are feeling disconnected um, simply for the fact of social media. I, I think a lot of people are going to want to be living in village um, communities. It's really good point on that because I've always loved Summerhill. I've, I've actually, Dulwich Hill has been on my Hot 100 for many years. I do the REA Hot 100 frequently. and I, But I like that. Petersham, Summerhill, they've got a really nice, just where the little local shops are, it's a con- place of congregation. It's a bit like the local pub, right? People come, it's a meeting place, and it's just got a great vibe. You know, you know and I think that there are parts of Sydney um, that also have this, like Mossman, for example. Mm. Mossman Village mm. has come alive since COVID, mm. and if you if you if you go down there at the moment on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock, it is is vibrant. Yeah. Um, but there are other areas that that haven't done the same, and the inner west. I think if you're looking at its strengths, has always had that village atmosphere. Mm. You go down to the local shop, you know who the business owner is, you know who's you, you're talking by name with people. Mm. I, I, I do think that is something that people really do value. Mm. And the types of properties that you can buy in these areas, I still believe, um, are really, really good value. So that's what I'd be looking at. Mm. I, I also just, if you're looking to invest and to, I think, have a, you know, an opportunity for some good capital gains. I just think apartments across across Sydney in general, mm. um, not newer buildings, the older buildings. Mm. It just hasn't had it, the gap between the apartment prices and mm. house prices mm. has widened yes. enormously yep. since COVID. Mm. And at some point, mm. people want to look to affordability, yep. and there will be a shift back there. It might not be this year, but it could be in 2025. Mm, excellent point. Tell me about your experience in dealing with buyers agents. I mean, a lot of your, your team would, would deal with people like myself. What's, what's been that sort of interaction? How's the experience and how does it differ from, from the, perhaps the ordinary buyer? Well, obviously, you know, I, I find that buyers that, that engage a buyer's agent then tend to, you know, not let the emotive side <laughs> of buying enter into as much because that can be a good thing and a bad thing for a buyer it could be a bad thing because you might end up paying a lot more than what you should for something mm. but it can also be a bad thing because you're so emotional and and, and anxious about something your strategy mm. might not be sound enough to secure a property mm. um, so we've got a philosophy at bw where we really like to work with buyers but if we get to a point where we've got a buyer that you know really has missed out on five or six properties and they need some you know they need a lot more guidance and a lot more hands-on um, coaching around the process. We will always refer them to a buyer's agent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that if you look at it from an auctions, you know, auction perspective, um, the buyer's agent gives you the best opportunity to be able to buy at auction if you're not an experienced buyer, mm-hmm. in, my, in my view, because the buyer's agent will probably employ a lot more aggressive strategy at the auction um, and will be a lot more decisive Mm. and you may not win an auction but you'll find out quicker whether or not you were an actual chance or not rather than waiting back and then yeah you know being overwhelmed by the situation so Mm. we 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 really value our relationships with um with buyers agents Mm. and i've got to the point now you know, where I, I actually, you know, thoroughly enjoy, you know, having good conversations with people like yourself, Rich, mm-hmm. and, you know, at the end of the day, helping provide information that can help buyers. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, fantastic. Great to hear that experience. Talk to me about, I guess, private treaty negotiation, different to an auction process. How do you approach the negotiation process with a potential buyer? And I guess on the flip side, how should the buyer approach you to get the best outcome as a sales agent? Yeah, I... Um, if we're talking, there's, there's, there's two parts of this. There's the negotiation that can happen prior to auction. Yes, so I should mention it that way. As which well, yes. yeah. mm. I think is a very stressful mm. situation mm. for everyone. Mm. Seller, mm. buyer, and agent. Mm. And then you've got obviously private treaty. It might be off market. Yep. It might be that it's just a set price. Yeah. Um, different people approach these things differently, you know, we like to provide transparency and we like to give people opportunities. We never, one of the biggest things that I get so disappointed by is if I hear someone say, but we didn't get a call back to get an opportunity to maybe increase our offer. Yeah. 
we are not big fans of put your best offer forward by Friday at five o'clock. Mm-hmm. I just think that that's not a great outcome mm. um, for all parties. And we like to be able to create a process where the buyers feel that if they want to increase, they get an opportunity to increase. Now, the trouble with that is... Um, you have a pseudo auction. You have an auction before the auction, right? That's yeah. it. And, he, and then the agent's on the phone ringing 10 potential buyers and then you exhaust them until you get to that So what point. we so, would prefer to do yeah. is, and this is the benefit of BW having in-house auctioneers, not um, independent, is that we can... I would prefer at that point if we have two to three people that all want to offer at the same price, mm. the owner's willing to take that price, but mm. we can't sort out who, who you know, it's who's, gonna be. Mm. we bring the auction forward, forward yeah. and we create an auction buy. Yeah. And even if it's just yeah. the buyers there, it doesn't yeah. need to be the neighbors, just exactly. the buyers. Yeah. Uh, we'd prefer to do that. Mm. Um, I think that it's, it's counterintuitive um, for a buyer to make a very, very strong offer on a property um, that seems to probably have a little bit of interest very early on in the campaign mm. um, because you're going to most of the time end up in an auction before the auction that even though the agent might be attempting to make it as transparent as possible, yep. it doesn't feel that way and it can be very, very stressful. If mm. someone is thinking about we would like to make an offer prior to auction, mm. I would probably look to wait to see how the camp, I'd say to the agent, I just want you to know I am interested in this property. Mm. Yep. And I want you to know that if you are thinking about selling it prior to the auction, I want, I want you to let me know. Yep. And then I would wait until probably the final week and a half leading into the auction to determine whether or not I feel there's a lot of interest in on the property or not, and that's when I would I would make the offer, because that's something where you can then make a decision. Okay, they didn't take my offer. They want to they want to um, continue to go to auction. Mm. I can then make a decision. Do I want to go to that auction at that point, or do I want to mm. move on to something else? Yes. <clears throat> um, because the agent will be a lot more um, in tune with being able to make the decision on whether or not it's going to go to auction or whether or not we're going to treat in a prior situation. Yeah. So, Perfect. But like anything, just, Rich, I think, so, sorry to cut you off, yeah. this is why I think, you know, for a buyer that isn't experienced and doesn't have great relationships with the real estate agents, that's why employing a buyer's agent um, can be really beneficial. What you just described is exactly what I do. You must have read my mind. But that looking at that between that second, like most vendors need at least two weeks to test the market. And then, I mean, I don't know whether you do four-week auction campaigns, but a lot of auction campaigns are three weeks now, depending on demand, depending on the market. But it's that between that second and third week, I will test the agent out and say, look, my buyer, I'll tell them, I'm interested. I absolutely need to be kept informed. You know, my guys are ropeable if they don't get a call back. We had one the other day in the North Shore, first time ever. Matt and my team has been with me 16 years. Didn't get a call back from the agent and they sold it and undersold it. It was like, what the hell? The agent didn't do his job there, right? But we will always be have a very frank conversation with the agent as to where our interest lies and whether we should actually force the auction prior or wait till auction and play our cards on auction day. Yeah, because what could happen is if you, if you make a, a very big pre-auction offer in the first week mm. or even the first two days, mm. and yes, that offer actually might be what Mental fair wants. market value yeah. is, yeah. Mm. but an owner, even though they could be very, very um, logical with the way that they approach things, mm. all of a sudden gets emotional because it's our biggest asset yeah. If it's a property you've been living in, you're emotionally tied to it, all of a sudden you think, wow, yeah. if it's happened that quick. Then there must be three more people to make better offers. Yes. You know? And yeah. that becomes that becomes difficult to manage Very hard expectations. To manage. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just think as a buyer, you have to think about that. I can yeah. completely understand um, yeah. wanting to know whether or not I can buy this yeah. right. quite quickly. Yeah. Excellent. Really good tips there. A couple more questions for you. What do you love or what's the most rewarding thing about being a selling agent for you? Um, Oh, I think it's the same thing. I, I'm I'm still doing a lot of auctions. I'll still conduct four or five hundred auctions a year, but um, I'm not day to day selling anymore, running a business. But I guess it's the same 
philosophy that I have with, with running a business is that the ability to be able to help people yeah. um, and to grow. We're very fortunate, I think, working in our industry that you know one of the you know, essential things that people need is a home. So I'm talking here whether or not you're dealing with someone who's looking to, to lease out a property or buy a property mm. or sell. You know, people need a home. It's, it's a fundamental right, mm. and we have a great opportunity to help people through that process, awesome. which can be a very stressful process. So, mm. you know, that's, that's how I feel about our people in the business too, that if I'm helping them grow, yeah. um, you great. know, and playing a part, that makes a big difference. Awesome. Love it. So tell me about PropTech AI. It's all the flavor of the, the year. What, what are you doing in your business to keep up with technology, and do you use any kind of AI in your business? I think... What's happened over the course of the last five years has been that um, PropTech sometimes and the different companies that are out there have actually complicated things a little bit. And I saw some research um, with relation to um, businesses that, that manage and lease out properties, so that have property management as part of their business, that um, since the introduction of a lot of PropTech companies that were supposed to make the businesses more efficient, the number of properties that a property manager can manage has actually gone up, I mean down, sorry. Right. So it's the opposite. So they haven't become yeah. more efficient. Right. So I think you'll be very, very careful with the things that you implement. A lot of the um, a lot of the technology that's come into our industry, you then need to have a human that actually implements it really correctly. So I yeah. think you need to be very, very um, careful about yeah. that. However, for a business like us with AI, I think that is interesting yeah. because AI can now do things from a marketing point of view um, that can mean that properties are able to come to market quicker. Mm. And that's something that we're definitely exploring. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, generally if you decide that you're coming to market, you've got to get it photographed, you have to get it styled, you have to do a lot of things. And there's a lot of processes within that that um, a physical human being has to make that happen. There are certain areas where you might actually be able to use AI to speed up that process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we're definitely interested into because as you know, Rich, you, the market can change in three weeks. So mm -hmm. if you take three weeks to come to market, the conversation you have with an owner at the 1st of February might be different compared to the 1st of March. So speed to market actually is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also looking at a lot of different ways that just, just help us service mm -hmm. um, people yeah. more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, two more questions for you. Um, what has been, I guess, your most memorable, interesting or intriguing sale that you've been part of? Uh, there's been a lot um, in my time. I think that I don't really have, every different property has its, um, every different property has, you know, its benefits and its different highlights for what we experience selling them. Um, but we've had the pleasure of selling some really good homes. I mean, I think it was very, very interesting throughout the course of COVID when we basically went offline and were conducting auctions yeah, on, Zooms. Um, on yeah. Zooms or, you know, through other platforms like Realtor and so forth. I remember just my little sticky note, bit of number three, holding it up in front of the camera. You know? Yeah, so that, that was, that, I think that was an experience because it meant that as an auctioneer, for example, I had to move away from... Um, question-based auctioneering, which a lot of the time is what I'm doing, asking people, yeah. testing people, yeah. to more statement-based auctioneering, yes. where you're trying to put a statement out there that gets people thinking differently because you're not really getting as much feedback. interaction and yeah. feedback. Yeah. So that was, super, that was, that was I mm. think, a very interesting time. Mm. Um, oh, there's, been some, there's been some really, really good sales. We, we recently sold a property in, in, in Seaforth, um, and you know, that sold for just under $12 million. And for us as a business, that was a big milestone sale because you know, as we'd mentioned at the start of the mm. podcast, mm. we traditionally had been- Not in that area. Not in yeah, that area, not, right. not really selling that category of property. And you know, we've really tried to move into the five to fifteen million dollar category in recent times, and that, that I think that was a memorable, excellent, a memorable sale. Fantastic. Well, my last question for you, just briefly, what would be your best best property tip that you can share with our audience today? And this is one that I that I've um, you know had to convince myself. I think part of the problem of being in the industry is you start thinking about timing the market. 
you know about this. <laughs> Absolutely. And especially if you've got a mind where you like listening to what's happening with the Reserve Bank, yeah. what's happening in the economy. Um, my biggest thing is, you know, time in market, don't time the market. I know a lot of people do, do say that. Yeah. Um, and I do believe in different areas of Australia, you can look at this slightly differently, but in Sydney by and large, yeah. we are an international city. Um, real estate is viewed really intensely as an asset class. Mm. And I think that you've got to really have time in the market. Yeah, hey. that's a great tip. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. no, I love, totally agree with that. I think a lot of people try to, you know, they, they procrastinate, they delay, they overanalyze, and they miss out on so many opportunities because they're trying to time it. But as you and say- And I've personally been through yeah. it. Yeah. I had, a, I had an opportunity to buy a property um, at the start of COVID when things were, were down and um, you know, I didn't because I thought, no, things are going to go down a little bit more. And I got, I got to, I had analysis paralysis and I overanalyzed things and I didn't buy it. That same property you could have bought for 2.4, yeah. um, then was selling in 2023 for 4.3. Wow. There you go. Opportunity cost right there, folks. Right. So now <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying yeah. that, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm doing bad by any means, yeah. but I think yeah. that like, even for those of us in the industry, we sometimes overanalyze things. Well, it's, it's good to get an objective view. I mean, that's why we have a business too. But I always say to people, if you've got borrowing capacity, use it. Mm. Otherwise, it's gone. I mean, some years you might have a great year, sometimes you might have a bad year, depending on your salary or commissions or whatever. But yep. if you've got borrowing capacity, borrow safely, get into the market, and you'll, and you'll be thanking yourself yep. for many years to come. Well, look, Thomas, thank you so much. There were some awesome tips in today's podcast. I really appreciate you spending the time with me today. And uh, yeah, really wish you all the best for, for the year ahead. Thanks, Thomas. You too, Rich. Thank you very much for having me. So thanks again for joining us on another edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. We'd love to help you and we look forward to engaging with you on another edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. Bye for now. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer Podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates, weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer Podcast.